Thank you so much. We're so excited to be here this week or these next two days or sessions with you. And we would love for you to join and sing with us, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. You know, the God that created the heavens and the earth deserves all of our praise and glory. And the word should be above on the screen, so please join in with us. The next one goes right along with this one, and it'll be um, 
How Great Is Our God, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's been around for a little while now. So, do you want And please help us sing. To the photo, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the photo, sisters, for being here. I had the privilege of uh, getting to preach after uh, they did a similar kind of thing at the Louisiana Baptist Convention. It was a great time. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. God, we praise and exalt your name. You are a great God and greatly to be praised. And your greatness is unsearchable. And you are good. Your mercy endures forever. It endures to all generations. And you are kind. And you are love. And we exalt and praise your holy name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're so thankful to have Ken with us. Ken Ham. And uh, you no doubt heard him this morning or have heard him since. He is the president and CNO, CEO of Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And there's a lot to be said and we're going to give him the time to do it. Please join with me in welcoming Ken Ham.
Well, good evening. Well, it's great to see you uh, back here again. And for those that were here this morning, we talked about the importance of the book of Genesis, how foundational it is to the rest of the Bible, and that we're losing a lot of our young people from our church, that America is changing, it's becoming more secular every day, and a lot of it's because we haven't raised up generations to know how to defend their faith. So Answers in Genesis, an apologetics organization, we equip people with answers to be able to defend their faith. And tonight, I am going to do some teaching on apologetics, dealing with a, a number of issues, particularly centered around answering the question, how do you explain all the different types of people that we have in the world? People will call them races, but we're going to see they're not races. And we're going to do a lot more than that tonight, too. We're even going to find out if a poodle really is a dog. We could have a vote on it later, and uh, we'll see, but we'll find out about that. Well, uh, Answers in Genesis opened the Creation Museum in 2007. How many of you have already been to the Creation Museum? Uh, that's the minority of you. Well, did you know the rest of you, everyone is going to be going to northern Kentucky for their vacation from now on. <laughs> that's true, and I want to I show you why. I want to show you two short videos, first of all. First of all, about the Creation Museum, and then about the life-size ark that we're opening July 7. So plan all your vacation after July 7, and then go to northern Kentucky. There's a lot more to do in the area, by the way. It really is uh, uh, quite an area. In fact, an hour and a quarter from the Creation Museum is the biggest Air Force museum in the world, set up as a walk through history, World War I, World War II, better than the Smithsonian. See, it, that's just, and, and that's sort of a little bonus after you go to the Creation Museum and the Ark. But there's lots of other things like that too. So see, northern Kentucky, that's the place for your vacation. And you'll see why when I show you these two videos. The acclaimed Creation Museum and outreach of Answers in Genesis is a one-of-a-kind museum filled with animatronic characters, interactive videos, a spectacular planetarium, a special effects theater, and many other world-class exhibits. Since its opening in 2007, the Creation Museum has welcomed millions of guests at its 49-acre location in the greater Cincinnati area. The state-of-the-art 70,000-square-foot museum brings the pages of the Bible to life, helping answer the skeptical questions that cause people to doubt that the Bible is true. The dramatic finale of the museum is the last Adam film, where guests experience the glory of God's redemptive plan and hear a clear and powerful presentation of the gospel message. Since the museum's opening, we have heard countless testimonies from adults and young people whose lives have been changed through a museum visit. Now discover how it might change your own life for Christ. Plan your visit at creationmuseum.org and prepare to believe. Now you'll realize you've got to go for that anyway, right? And uh, then on July 7, we're actually opening a life-size Noah's Ark. It's well under construction. I'll show you a little video in a moment. Actually, that's only phase one. Eventually, we're going to be building a wall city, a Tower of Babel, first century village, many other things as well. Interstate 75, halfway between Cincinnati and Lexington, 45 minutes from the Creation Museum. The Lord enable us to obtain 800 acres. And we have 230 or so of those acres permitted, set aside, uh, to be able to develop the entire park. And there's the Noah's Ark that's under construction right now. 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet high, built 15 feet off the ground. So from ground level to the rooftop is seven stories. It's anchored to three seven-story towers, and they're already completed. Those three towers house the restrooms, the elevators, and the exit stairs, just to give you an idea what the ark's going to look like um, from the other side there, although you won't see those towers when you first come up to it. But this is a video we just produced this past week, and it's, it's even out of date since then because construction happens very rapidly. There's 170 construction workers on site and then 30 who are involved in installing exhibits, 200 people on site working uh, each day. And it's quite an interesting place. But I'm just going to show you an excerpt of this which sort of summarizes it for you. People come off Interstate 75 and they'll get on Route 36 and then come to the large parking lot. 4,000 car spaces. They'll then go to the ticket booth and get on shuttles. These shuttles will take them on a mile ride down a valley, across a creek, and up the other side, and they'll be basically leaving the modern world and then coming up into Noah's world. And it is a beautiful drive. Now inside the ark, there's 132 ark bays that are filled with world-class exhibits. 
covering lots of different topics about Noah's life, about how Noah could have fit all the animals, all the animal kinds, the land animals, on board Noah's Ark, how many would need to be on board the Ark, about flood legends from around the world. There'll be sculptured animals in cages. There'll be information on how they could have been fed and watered and waste products removed. And then there's going to be exhibits too on how do we know the Bible's true. And we're going to present the gospel, but in a very tasteful but challenging way to people. As people exit the ark on the lower deck, they'll then go down a ramp into a very large gift shop. A very unique collection of gifts in here, including a large range of the basic creation apologetics books that Answers in Genesis produces. We also have a 1500 seat restaurant and eventually there'll be a 600 seat restaurant as well on the roof deck of the Ark. We have a very large petting zoo and some animal specialists who will be conducting special animal programs throughout the day after it is opened. We also have a massive zipline course, phenomenal ziplines across the valley, some really long ones, basically about 4,000 plus feet long. People are gonna find them a thrill to ride. You can even zipline across from the parking lot to the Ark and back again. Well, here I am on the roof deck of the biggest timber frame structure in the world, the life-size Noah's Ark, that's opening July 7. And for the first 40 days and 40 nights, we'll have daytime entry and evening time entry. So go online at arkencounter.com to get your tickets. Reserve your place in history. The voyage begins again July 7th. We got the idea, it's a big structure. It's a world class, it'll be a world class attraction. It's not very often that a conservative Christian organization is able to build a themed world class attraction that'll attract people from all over the world and yet be Christian and evangelistic. It's sort of rare for that to happen, but the Lord has entrusted that to us. And uh, we have even the designers, the sculptors, the artists, I mean, there's about 100 people just working on the exhibits. and. Uh, a lot of work is being done there. The voyage begins again uh, July 7. And watch uh, television uh, for our ads that show up like on Fox News. And we, we actually researched where most people go to church, what they watch on TV, for those that watch TV. We're even showing ads on The View. Because <laughs> apparently a lot of people actually watch that is what I found out. And, uh, but anyway, this is the 30 second ad. There's a 15 second and a 60 second. I'll just show you the advertisement. Maybe you can bring the sound up a bit for this. We wanted to actually have this produced. And we said, why shouldn't we be as good as the world, better than the world? We wanted it produced as if it's a trailer for a movie blockbuster. You get the idea? And uh, so this is what we did. There are things that cause the heart to wonder or inspiring things that can't be explained, that you never thought you would see. After more than 4,000 years, it's your moment to encounter the Ark. The voyage begins again, July 7. Now, I, want, I don't know whether you noticed, but there's a lot of work went into that uh, by our marketing agents and all of us together but it actually relates a little bit to what I'm going to talk about tonight. Because if you noticed, we had people with light skin and darker skin and people from different ethnic backgrounds and different sorts of people and ages. Did you notice all that? And see, because the message of the gospel is for every tribe and nation. And that's what I want to talk about. One of the books that I wrote 
uh, co-authored actually with an uh, African-American pastor, Dr. Charles Ware, is called One Race, One Blood. Because the question I have heard over and over again over the years, okay, you believe we all go back to Adam and Eve, how to explain all the races of people. Actually, Darwin, in his book, The Descent of Man, which followed 12 years after The Origin of the Species, actually wrote that there were different races at different levels and the Australian Aborigines were closer to the ape-like creatures and people from Africa were closer to the ape-like creatures than were others and so on. And you can understand how that promoted or fueled a type of racism. Not that I'm saying that Darwin was racist at all, but it certainly fueled, his ideas fueled uh, particular types of racism and prejudice. What I want to do tonight is to say this. Look, if the Bible is what it claims to be, the revealed word of God who knows everything, who's always been there, and God has given the history in his word about who we are, where we came from, where the universe came from. We could talk about lots of different topics. I want to deal particularly with this topic because the Bible tells us that God made Adam and Eve. You see, a lot of people say, well, because there's different races, God must have made different races. I've, I've, there are actually Bible colleges that have taught that sort of thing. There was a Bible college in my home country of Australia, you've probably heard my accent, uh, probably noticed I, I, had, well, I didn't have one until I came here and then <laughs> found out I suddenly got an accent somehow. And I know you're all jealous because Americans want to speak like Australians, you have to be born there to be able to speak like this. But, but you know, there was a Bible college in Australia that actually taught the Australian Aborigines weren't descendants of Adam and Eve, they were from another race, so there's no point in evangelizing them. See, see, the Bible makes it clear where to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every tribe and nation. You know why? Because we're all related to each other, because we all go back to Adam and Eve, because we're all one race. Now, that's what I wanted to talk about and, and answer some of the questions. You know, it's interesting. When you understand the gospel message, do you realize God's son stepped into history to be Jesus Christ, the God-man, to be a relative of ours, to be a descendant of Adam, to die for the descendants of Adam. So it's only descendants of Adam that can be saved. So it's important we understand there can only be one race, all descendants of Adam and Eve. I, I tell you what, one of the things I'm noticing more and more, be, because there's been such a lack of teaching in our churches, and because of the indoctrination in the public school education system, even though I know there's some Christian teachers, maybe some of you as missionaries in that system and you need our prayers because I know how hard it is. I was a missionary in the system in, in Australia and it wasn't as bad as it is today. But there's so much lack of understanding of things out there. In fact, you know what's happened? When I debated Bill Nye, how many of you saw the Bill Nye debate? Okay, a number of you, 15 million people, over 15 million have now watched that debate. I debated Bill Nye at the Creation Museum two years ago and it became a worldwide phenomenon. It was absolutely incredible. And uh, when, I, uh, when I debated Bill Nye, I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that I tried to get across to people was that, look, the evolutionists, the atheists, are trying to censor information from the public. And when the media said to me, you know, what do you hope to come out of the Bill Nye debate? If you haven't seen it, you can go online and watch it, by the way. We have the videos of it, too. Uh, it was an incredible debate. But they said, what do you hope to come out of this? I said, to open up a conversation. Because do you know that Bill Nye was actually pressured by many of the secularists not to debate me? You know why? They didn't want people to be able to hear the information. Normally, they won't debate creationists, Christians anymore, because they don't want people to hear the information. When you have to legislate to protect the teaching of evolution in the public schools, you know there's something wrong. And that's what they do. They legislate to protect it. Think about that. Why do you have to do that? Why would you be frightened of people hearing other uh, views instead of the evolutionist view if, if, if it was so right? Why would you be frightened of it? And I tell you, that, that, that the lack of understanding out there and the aggressiveness of the atheists more and more, the secularists against Christians in this nation is growing. And you should, what they do to us and the things they say to us is just absolutely mind-blowing, some of the stuff. But, and, and don't believe all you see on the internet. By the way, young people, when you look on the internet, don't believe all you see on the internet. And when you see stuff written about Christians, go and check it all out. Don't just believe any, the, the internet is, is, is a, a place for some of the worst stuff in the world, some of the best stuff in the world, and everywhere in between. And then you've got Facebook, and then you've got that sewer, or, uh, Twitter, uh, and, and, and that really is, that is a sewer in this way, I tell you. I mean, I'm on Twitter, and you can follow me on Twitter, but uh, you've got to be careful. A lot of people won't even 
respond to me on Twitter because they know that as soon as the atheists get hold of their, their Twitter handle, they will inundate them with all sorts of garbage. I mean, it's a shock. It, that, they are so aggressive out there. I, I was actually, I wrote an article once about uh, aliens in, in outer space because people said to me, do you believe there's intelligent life in outer space? And of course, you know, first answer is, well, there's not much on Earth anymore. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and there's not much in Washington, D.C., we know that, but... But uh, I, I answered the question and I said, look, I don't believe there's aliens in outer space. I don't believe in intelligent life in outer space. A number of reasons. You know, the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God and, and that the earth is for the sons of men. And there's all sorts of other scriptures I can point out. God made the earth first and, and he made life on the earth. And then he put the sun, moon and stars in there for signs and for seasons and so on. I could point to all sorts of scriptures like that. But I said, look, even from a perspective of the gospel, think about it. God's son stepped into history to be the God-man. He didn't step into history to be the god Klinon or something like that, right? But the God-man, and he remains the God-man to be our savior. Uh, and, and so I said, therefore, it doesn't make sense that there's other beings out there because the whole universe suffers from Adam's sin. And one day it's all gonna be wound up and judged by fire and God's make, gonna make a new heavens and a new earth so it wouldn't make sense because they can't have salvation. Uh, the only people who can be saved are the descendants of Adam. So guess what the atheist did? Headlines. Ken Ham believes aliens are going to hell. <laughs> That's why you've got to be careful of everything you read of there. You, you, if, if you on the internet, you go home and type out Ken Ham, aliens, hell. You'll see all these different uh, headlines come up and, uh, because they have no idea. They have no understanding of the gospel. And anyway, they want to be able to try to denigrate us. But... Okay, so let's get into this. By the way, that doesn't count for my time tonight. I, I, that was just, all that is just introduction, okay? So, God made Adam and Eve. The first question I get asked is, now wait a minute, if God made Adam and Eve, the Bible says they had Cain and Abel and Seth, three sons, so where did Cain get his wife? So let, let's go through that real quickly. And I like to do it this way. Question, can you marry your relation? Yes, no, probably, only after counseling. <laughs> and I ask that question because people have this idea when you get married, you can't marry your relation. I've got news for you. If you don't marry your relative, you don't marry a human, then you've really got a problem. Do you realize when you get married, you marry your relation, right? Now, it's best not to marry a close relation today. That's true, and I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you in a moment. So you do marry your relative. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15.45, the first man, Adam. It's very obvious there's only one man to start with. The first man, his name was Adam. God made Adam from dust. And then God took his side and made a woman. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother. In fact, Hebrew literally reads, to be the mother, to be the mother of all the living. So one man, one woman. God made of one blood. Tomorrow night, uh, the last session that I do here, I'm doing two sessions in the morning for the kids, the little kids, uh, 9 o'clock, and then the high schoolers at 11. But you're welcome to come to all those. And I find parents enjoy them all. Uh, and you're welcome to do that. But tomorrow night, I'm going to talk on how to present the gospel in a secularized culture in, like in America. I, I think many Christians are not doing it the way we need to do it. There's a major problem in reaching people today. But anyway, as part of what I say there, God made of one blood, as, as Paul is preaching to the Greeks, God made of one blood, we're all related, all people who dwell on the face of the earth. And then people say, okay, so there's one man, one woman... And they had Cain and Abel and Seth. Well, where did Cain get his wife? I was in a restaurant in London once, in England, and the chef found out we were doing a creation seminar nearby, and he came over and said, you believe the Bible? I said, yeah, I believe the Bible. He said, I don't believe the Bible. I said, why not? Well, he said, the Bible says God made Adam and Eve, and they had Cain and Abel. Where did all the people come from then? And I thought, oh, where did Cain get his wife? He's asking the question. So I said, well, Genesis 5.4 says Adam had sons and daughters. And he looked at me and he said, oh, Really? Oh, I didn't read that far. Well, that's the problem with a lot of people. They don't read that far. So get rid of all outside influences for the moment. If Adam and Eve had sons and daughters, then originally brothers must have married sisters. Now, as soon as you say that today, people say, wait a minute, that's wrong, that's immoral. They even use words like incest and so on. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When you get married, you do marry your relative. Abraham was married to his half-sister, and it wasn't a problem. It wasn't until the time of Moses that God said, no longer can close relatives marry. You see, let's understand this from a biblical history perspective and then talk about it 
in regard to the way some of these atheists talk about it too. Because when I answered this on radio once, there was an atheist called up and he said, I'm an atheist. And you believe brothers married their sisters? That's immoral. Sir, you're an atheist. You can't call anyone immoral. That's the first problem, okay? Because <laughs> on what do you base your standards? You can't do that. And then he said, well, it's incest. Actually, the word incest is a modern word. I mean, I think it came about in the 13th, 14th century, somewhere around about then. And we put a whole range of things under incest, uh, some of which uh, have always been wrong, but not brother and sister marriage in the context of biblical history like this. See, provided marriage is one man for one woman, which is what the doctrine of marriage is all about. Look, God made Adam and Eve, and they were perfect. But then sin entered the world. And because of sin, now God... The Bible says in Colossians, he upholds all things by the power of his word. But because of sin and the curse, now he said you will die. Everything is running down. The whole creation groans. God no longer upholds things uh, perfectly. So now things run down. You know what happens? When genes are copied from one generation to the next, there are mistakes or mutations that get into those genes and then they get copied to the next generation and get additional mistakes and they get copied to the next generation and get additional mistakes until 6,000 years later, <laughs> look around the room. And you see the problems, right? Actually, we have a genetic load that's quite immense. And it means life can't go on forever. By the way, the mutation rate, if you understand what the evolutionists are saying, do you realize life couldn't, we couldn't even evolve to the ape-like stage because it would have been wiped out before then because of all the mistakes. That's a whole other uh, argument. I'll come back to that one in a moment. But see, here, here's, here we are. Here's, um, here's the thing we need to understand. Today, if brother and sister were to marry, here's the problem. You've got similar mistakes, most likely inherited from your parents. And so, sperm fertilizes egg, those mistakes get together, they can reinforce each other and increase likelihood of deformities, problems in the offspring. That's why it's better to marry someone further away in relationship from you. So where they have a bad gene, you've got a good one, so it just masks the bad gene. So that's why you can look in the mirror and see your nose is crooked and your ears are out of whack and your eyes are a little out of whack and your chin's sort of not quite there. And we, we've got, Those mistakes actually show up. They're there, but they're masked. But the further back you go in history, would that be more of a problem or less of a problem? Less of a problem. Adam and Eve had no mistakes. Their children would have had relatively few. So from a perspective of genetics, brother marrying sister wouldn't have been a problem, right, originally, provided it's one man for one woman. Do you realize a man and woman getting married today is no different than a man and woman getting married uh, back in Adam and Eve's day, except in the closeness of the relationship? Because we're all humans, we're all relatives, we all go back to Adam and Eve. So you see, when somebody says, well, that's incest, well, first of all, in our modern understanding of that word, we put a whole range of things under there, but that is a made-up word in, in our modern era of history. And there was nothing wrong with brother and sister marriage originally, provided it was one man for one woman. It, it, actually, the laws against close intermarriage were given to the, to the Israelites, and they make sense because today it's best that close relations not marry, and there's no need for it anyway because there's so many people. So you see, those things are easy to understand. Then there are people that say, well, wait a minute. The Bible says Cain went out to the land of Nod and got his wife. No, the Bible does not say that. The Bible says Cain went out to the land of Nod and knew his wife, had sexual relations with his wife. He was already married. Well, it says he was frightened of people. Who was he frightened of? Well, do you realize when you look at the time between Cain uh, and, and uh, the time between uh, then when they were born and when Cain killed Abel, do you know there's, there's almost 100 years. Do you, do you realize there would have been a lot of people by then? Population growth is exponential. I mean, I look at our family. You know, there's I and my wife, and now we have 15 grandchildren. <laughs> and so it goes, it, it, things grow pretty quick. My, my mother has, what is it, 40 something great grandchildren. And, and so it goes on. You know, by the time of Cain killing Abel, there would have been a lot of people. Who was Cain frightened of? His family, because he killed one of them. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. So, see, these things are easy to answer and they're important to answer. You know, it's interesting when uh, the atheists uh, make these sorts of accusations. Some of you might have seen in the news, there's an atheist group in northern Kentucky that are protesting the Creation Museum. 
By the way, an atheist group in northern Kentucky protested, uh, sorry, the Ark Encounter, protested the Creation Museum. When we opened it in 2007, they were outside protesting and they hired a plane to drag a banner above the Creation Museum back and forward that said, thou shalt not lie. Uh, it's interesting, the people that say you can't put the Bible in public were putting the Bible in public, but uh, that's an interesting issue. I found out years later that most people who saw that banner being dragged across the front thought it was us who hired the plane to say that about the atheists, so <laughs> that backfired on them. And, and you know, the other interesting thing is when we first obtained a piece of property for our creation museum, the atheists caused such a problem, put, put um, pressure on a local court that they revoked the zoning so that we couldn't use it and because they thought they'd stopped us. And you know what happened? We got another piece of property, which was far better, right on the interstate, 10 minutes from the airport, right at an interchange. And what men meant for evil, God meant for good. And we've seen that happen over and over again. So we, we are looking forward to what's going to come out of the atheist's latest. Uh, they're actually raising money for billboards. And these are the billboards they're putting up in our area. That's the billboard right there. <laughs> Genocide and incest park. 2,000 years of celebrating myths, it says. And for $500, you can have your picture on this billboard drowning under the ark. That's what, that, that's what they're doing. By the way, do you, do you see a problem here? Accusing God of genocide? How can an atheist make a moral judgment like that? They can't do that. And they have no understanding that God is a righteous God who judged because of man's wickedness and wickedness of people like this atheist. And then incest, see, again, making a moral judgment like that, not even understanding the term. Think about it from an evolutionist perspective. They believe man evolved from ape-like creatures. And as man evolved, and man, we're just animals. So anyone could have relations with anyone, what, whatever, doesn't matter, whoever, how many, whatever, and he thinks we got the problem? When we're saying marriage is one man for one woman for life, I mean, who's got the problem here? And you know, I, I wanted to show you this, so this is gonna extend my talk a little bit, and this is not a part of my talk, so this is a little extra, but I wanted to show you the video that they put on Indiegogo for their fundraising campaign, because I want you to see the nature of what they're doing out here. You know, it's not the ark that they're against. It's God's word. And you'll see that very clearly, watch this. I am Jim Helton, president of the Tri-State Freethinkers and regional director for American Atheists here in Kentucky. Answers in Genesis is spending $150 million to build a replica of Noah's Ark called the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky. We at the Tri-State Freethinkers will defend their right to build such a park. However, we find this story immoral that's in the Bible and highly inappropriate for children. In addition to, state government is giving them millions of dollars of tax incentives while allowing them to have discriminatory hiring practices. Answers in Genesis is planning a launch of this theme park based on genocide and incest July 7th. We at the Tri-State Freethinkers need your help. We want to raise enough money to put up billboards all over the area to let people be aware of how horrible this story in the Bible actually is. The more money we get, the more billboards we can put up in all different areas. In addition to, we want to do a counter-protest on their opening day and throw a huge party for, and invite all the Freethinkers and atheists to come all over to show support for reason and logic and not superstition and myths. And with a special donation, we will take all donations, and any support is appreciated, but with a special donation of $500, you can join myself, along with other famous atheists and free thinkers, including David Silverman, president of American Atheists, and be drowning in the ocean looking up to the ark. And what an honor that will be. Now, now, did you notice he said, we have discriminatory hiring practices and getting tax incentives. Now let me tell you something before I play you the last little bit of this, okay? So, the Kentucky government offers a tourism tax incentive if you build a tourist facility, which involves, you have to be approved by consultants, and it means once you're opened, and once you're generating sales tax, the sales tax you generate only within your own facility, you're given a rebate on that. Uh, over 10 years, up to a certain maximum, uh, depending on what the consultants approve. And the reason is, it's like they offer these things all across the nation. If you bring your business here, we'll give you this tax incentive. It's the same sort of thing as that. And 
you know, the Speedway has received it, the Bourbon Distillery Museum has received it, uh, Kentucky Kingdom uh, uh, Amusement Park has received it, and so it goes on. And we were approved for it, but then the then governor, we have a new governor now, the then governor actually said, they wrote us a letter and actually said, because you're going to tell people about Jesus, and in a, you call it an evangelistic ark, you can't get the tax incentive because we can't use, we can't give you a tax incentive. We're the government, we can't do that. And then they said, also, we notice that you hire Christians and they have to sign a statement of faith. That's discriminatory, so obviously you, you can't have these tax incentives. So we went to the federal court, went to a federal judge, and he took a year to rule. And, and he ruled on the First Amendment, free exercise of religion, you can't discriminate against Christians. You can't say that they don't have equal rights with other companies. You can't do that. And secondly, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 specifically says if you're a religious organization, you have right to religious preference in hiring. Do you think the American atheists would hire a Bible-believing Christian like me to head up the American atheists? <laughs> right? And, and so there's those exemptions. Now, I want you to keep in mind, he didn't tell everyone there that we won the lawsuit and the judge ruled in our favor, and we shouldn't be allowed to receive tax incentives. So here's this atheist group. I thought I'd pay you just the last few seconds of his video. Appreciate all your support. And remember, all donations are tax deductible. <laughs> okay, so you get it. <laughs> you see that. Well, okay, so we can answer where did Cain get his wife, but how do we explain the so-called races? Well, as I said, there aren't any so-called races. Look, to do this, the first thing we have to do if we want to explain how we all come from Adam and Eve and have all these differences, we've got to have a basic course in genetics. Sorry about that, but we do. So I'm going to give you a basic course in genetics tonight. These are basic principles, big picture. It's much more technical than this, but it gives you the idea. And then we're going to apply that to the humankind. In Genesis 1, we read that God made the animals and plants after his kind or after their kind. Ten times we read that. What does it mean by the word kind? Okay, so the Hebrew word is min. And one of the things that you'll hear over and over again are the skeptics who say, wait a minute, Noah couldn't fit all the species of animals on the ark. They always use the word species. Well, the Bible doesn't use the word species because the word species is also a modern word. It's a made-up word. See, man invented an arbitrary classification system, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And God doesn't use those terms, right, because they're man, man's invented terms. He uses kind. So what does the word kind mean? Well, we would say to you that our scientists and all the research we've done, we believe the word kind is more at, in most instances, the family level or even the order level, but usually not genus or species, mainly family and some order. For instance, dogs, take God, dogs. There's one dog family, Canadae, different genera, different species. We would say God made the dog family, the dog kind. That's what we're saying. And the reason we say that is, and dogs is one that I want to use tonight because it's one that a lot of work has been done on. Here's what our scientists have been doing, ready for the ark project. They have been looking at all the land animals uh, that are alive today and those in the fossil record that are extinct. But the ones that are alive, they, and the ones that are extinct, you can't do this with. And so, therefore, you have to be liberal and just allow a lot more. But we think, we think our number is way overestimated. But with dogs, for instance, this dog has been documented to breed with this one, and this one, this one, and this one, this one, and this one, this one, all around the world to this one. This one never bred with this one, but it did breed with this one that bred with that one. That one didn't breed with that one, but it bred with this one that bred with that one that bred with that one. You get the idea? And if you can document all that, they say, there's one kind. Now, our number is way overestimated, but we think probably as few as 2,000 animal kinds, maybe even 1,500. But let's, let's say 3,000, just to add on whatever. We think it's way overestimated. Two of each kind, seven of some. The average size of a land animal is smaller than a rat, actually. It's pretty small. People, there was tons of room on the ark for the land animal kinds. With cats, one cat family, one cat kind. But let's look at dogs to understand this. Because speciation is used in the public school textbooks as an example of evolution. And whenever people today give you evidence of evolution. If you ask for an evidence of evolution, I was on BBC television a number of years ago with a professor of genetics at London University, 
And I just said to him in front of the BBC audience, I said, look, millions of people are watching this program. Why don't you give them the best evidence? You're going to convince everyone evolution's obviously true. What's the best evidence you can give? And he said, well, that's easy. We have these salmon that produce different species of salmon. And I said, and they're still salmon. Very profound statement. And you know what? People got it. Wow, salmon produce salmon. Wow, that convinces me evolution's true. What do they do in the public school textbooks? Darwin's finches. Look, you've got finches with medium-sized beaks and, and small beaks and large beaks. Wow, that's evolution. What were they? Finches. What are they? Finches. What will they be? Finches. Is that evolution? That's just finches. So you can look at all the different species of dogs. The secular world says the dog family is a diverse group of 34 species. And so you've got all these different species. And then they say this, based on genetic, morphological, and behavioral data, it's clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf. So something like that gave rise to the domestic species, including these. Of course, when you look at that, it looks like a dog. When you look at that, you wonder. And you say, how could that give rise to that and that and that? <laughs> Basically, it involves a loss of information. That's true. You see, if you look at the dog kind, when you look at the genetics, there's lots of information, but, but there's not as much information in some species as there is in others. And in some, there's just not a great deal, actually. <laughs> Poodles are sort of borderline whether you can even, you know, I mean, if they lost any more information, that, that's it, they'd be gone. Uh, and so I want to explain this to you because when you understand the aspect of genetic information, you realize the evidence they give for evolution is the opposite of evolution. We don't know how many dogs God made originally. Let's say he made two dogs, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and we end up with lots of dogs. <laughs> sort of like a typical homeschool family today. Okay, so... Now, we know in genetics, we label genes with capital letters for dominant genes and little letters for recessive genes, okay? And so, here we have a male and female dog. There are millions of these. Keep in mind there's millions of these, but here we have a male and female dog, and they've got big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c, uh, fertile, uh, you, sexual reproduction, one set of genes from the male, one from the female, fertilization, there's an individual. Notice that individual, if, if the male and female to start with were dogs, that individual's a dog. All the information is dog genes, okay? But it no longer has a little a's and little b's and little c's, which means it's actually lost information. It's got less information than the parents, less variability than the parents. And then you can get all these other combinations. Now, I like to use this one here, the little a's, little b's, little c's, to represent our, what we call purebred dogs. You know, purebred like poodles, chihuahuas. Do you know why we call them purebred? Because in reality, they've got a lack of information. And, and what we've done is, look, how do we get our purebred dogs? Oh, here's a dog with a short nose and a dog with a short nose. Let's breed them together so we've no longer got the genes, the genes for long nose here. You get the idea? And so what happens is we, we get rid of variability to get these purebreds. The problem is because we live in a sin-cursed universe, there are mutations. And so when you do that, you're concentrating mutations, which is why if you've got one of these purebred dogs, okay, you know as soon as you get one, you've got to start putting money away because you've got to take them to the vet. You know, this one has problems with arthritis. This one gets this problem. This one has problems with its eyes. It costs you millions of dollars to keep them alive. Whereas the dog down the street that's a mixture of everything in the neighborhood, you can run over them with a truck and they'll get up and wave and off they go. Okay, because they've got much more variability, all right? Now, so think about this. If... If this is a poodle, if you breed a poodle with a poodle, all you can get is what? Poodle. Isn't that pretty sad? That's all you can get. I mean, could you breed poodles together and get back to the original dogs? And the answer is no, you can't. You don't have the information to do it. But theoretically, could you start with the original dogs and again get poodles? And the answer is yes. And by the way, when it, when it comes to poodles, we have to understand... See, people say to me, but didn't God make poodles? No, well, think about this. When God made everything, he said it was very good. <laughs> the correct definition of a poodle, if you want the correct definition of a poodle, it's a sin-cursed, degenerate, mutated copy of the original. 
That's a true definition of a pearl. And when you understand that, you can answer all sorts of questions. I, I have people say to me, well, is my poodle going to be in heaven with me? With me? Well, that's easy. There's no sin in heaven. <laughs> okay, the poodles of the world are going to unite. Poodle lovers of the world are going to unite against me. I can see that right now. Okay, now, let me help you understand something else. Do you know how much variability is in our genes? See, this is what most people don't understand. Do you know how much variability is in our genes? Do you know what that number is? One followed by 80 zeros? the number of atoms they estimate in the universe. You know how small an atom is? That's a massive number. If you took one man and one woman from this audience, just with the genetic variability you have now, do you know how many children you could potentially have without having two with the same combination of information? That number. Compared to the number of atoms in the universe. See, here, here, here's why people don't understand this. When you understand this at a genetics level and, and the amount of information, you realize, wait a minute, God made the dog pool of information, the cat pool, the elephant pool. Two dogs went on Noah's Ark. They had that sort of variability. The dogs came off the ark after the flood, and as they build up a number and they split up and move away from each other, what happens? What happens is you get different combinations of information that end up in different groups. And to explain to you, what they call natural selection, you've heard of natural selection, adaptation, and speciation, they're all used in an evolutionary context in the science textbooks in our public schools to teach students that this is the mechanism for evolution. I'm gonna say right here and now, when you correctly understand natural selection, adaptation, and speciation, it is the opposite of evolution, opposite to what the students are being taught. Let me explain what's going on. Here are two dogs that have an S gene for short hair and an L gene for long hair. They got off Noah's Ark, fell in love, had two, there was only two. And they had an offspring, which inherited both S genes. Wait a minute, it's got something new, short hair. See, this is how they convince children of evolution. Oh, look, something new. It gained a resistance to antibiotics. It's got short hair, it's something new. That's evolution, it's something new. But when you look inside at the genetics, it's not new information, it's a new combination of the information that was already there. It's actually got less variability than the parents. Bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics, in a lot of instances, it's actually because of a loss of information and they're not as strong as the originals. Then you can get one that has the same and one that has or long hair genes. Oh, look, something new, it's got long hair. Oh, look at these finches that have the bigger beaks. It's evolution. No, it's just a new combination of the information already there. So natural selection adaptation, what happens? Okay, as dogs increase in number, some move towards a cold climate. In a cold climate, those with short hair and medium hair get cold. <laughs> and then they die. And now you're left with dogs that only have L genes, which on their own only have what? L genes. What about those that move towards a hot climate? In a hot climate, those with long hair and medium hair overheat. And they die. And now you're left with dogs with S genes who are on their own only produce dogs with S genes. So what's new? A new combination of already existing information that has less variability than the parents, the opposite of evolution. So natural selection, when you correctly understand it, involves loss of information, new combinations of information, conserving information that's there, opposite of an evolutionary process that requires brand new information that wasn't there, added into the genes. People, evolution is impossible. It doesn't happen, it can't. Speciation has nothing to do with evolution. Natural selection has nothing to do with evolution. All that's happening is what's already there, the information is being sorted out in some way. And so over time what happens is, you end up with all sorts of different species of dogs, and most of that has already happened. That's why you don't see as much speciation today, because they've already spread out. In fact, it's remarkable the amount of genetic variability God built, built into a kind. Deer and moose are the same kind, and, and, and so it goes on. And so, from an evolutionary perspective, they say that somehow matter turned into life, they didn't even try to deal with that, but, and over millions of years, one kind changed into another. Do you realize, according to evolutionists, there's one tree of life. You might laugh at this, but do you realize 
evolutionists actually believe humans are related to bananas. Bananas. <laughs> Sometimes I have to translate as I'm going along. There's a Smithsonian exhibit in public libraries right now that has big boards and charts, and it says on one of them, who are you related to, chimps and bananas. Think about that for a moment. See, you know, you've got these animal rights people saying you shouldn't eat animals and so on. Well, if they're going to be consistent as an evolutionist, they shouldn't eat plants either, which would solve a lot of problems. So, some of you got that, some of you did not. That's okay. So, from, an evol from a creationist perspective, God made kinds, family, maybe order level, but he made kinds. Because of the genetic variability, you can have different species of dogs, but they're still dogs. You can have different species of finches, but they're still finches. Different species of elephants, but they're still elephants. In other words, from a creationist perspective, it's an orchard, not a tree. It's lots of different trees. You get the idea? By the way, that's exactly what science confirms. Lots of different trees. Now, help us understand further. Here I am holding a jar of jelly beans representing, say, the variability in, in dogs. Over time, you can get less and less information to get to the stage where there's just not a great deal left. <laughs> and I can't stand cats, but that's another issue. What I'm telling us is there was plenty of room on Noah's Ark for the kinds because probably, probably as few as 2,000 kinds of land animals. Two, two of some, seven of some. And you know what we're doing in the Ark project? We're doing all the calculations and so on, but we're allowing even for a lot more kinds. And it, with bats, because we, we can't document exactly all those in interbreed together, so we've got a number of separate kinds of bats, but there's probably only one kind anyway. So even it, our, our estimates, we allow for a lot more than probably what is reality, and yet there's still tons of room on the ark. Now, what I want you to think about is this. When you look around the world, we see Australian Aborigines, the American Indians, and the Fijians, and the Hawaiians, and you see all the, these different people groups. How, how could that happen? Well, think about genetics, think about dogs. You'd have to have something in human history that split the population up so that they moved away from each other and were isolated from each other. Can anyone think of any event, any event at all, <laughs> in biblical history? People, the Bible tells you, the Tower of Babel, God gave different languages. Genesis 10 gives you the table of nations. Genesis 11 is the detail of what happened. They moved away from each other according to their languages. And that's it. That's why you have flood legends in cultures all over the world similar to the Bible because the real record that hasn't changed is in the Bible. The others were handed down and changed. You have elements similar to the Bible. Do you know what I was taught in university, what people are taught today? The Babylonians have flood legends like the Jews. It's obvious the Jews borrowed their stories from the Babylonians. No, it's the other way around. In fact, when you read the Bible's account compared to some of these other accounts, some of them have a boat that's a cube and seven stories high. Wow, that'd survive a flood. And some of them have gods cutting each other in half and water spewing out. The Bible talks about this massive ship that's six to one ratio, water from below, water from above. I mean, the Bible's account reads as real history and makes sense with what we know. You know, when Darwin published his book on the origin of species by natural selection, the rest of the title says, or the, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Now, Darwin particularly talked about animals. But you see, what Darwin was doing, it was very deliberate. He wanted to take his views of evolution on animals and apply it to humans. And at the end of The Origin of Species, he actually said this in that book. In the distant future, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. He intended all along to try to explain how man evolved. And in his book, The Descent of Man, that followed about 12 years later, he actually... In there, discuss that, in fact, there's a number of quotes we could use, but he's a very convoluted writer, so it, you know, for one quote, you've got to quote two pages of what he writes. Uh, how many of you have read Origin of Species? How many of you have read Descent of Man? <laughs> Hardly anyone. Do you realize most evolutionists haven't read The Origin of Species? 
Most evolutionists have never read The Descent of Man. We all talk about Darwin and most people have never read him. He's a horrible writer in my opinion. I don't know why people even, you wonder when you're reading it, how could people like, like this? Because it's so convoluted. But anyway, he, in The Descent of Man, he actually says that, the, that, that people from Africa and the Australian Aborigines were closer to the apes than what he called the Caucasians, which were further away. He actually says that in The Descent of Man. Which, which is why the late Stephen Jay Gould, who was an ardent evolutionist who was at Harvard University, said this, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Darwin wasn't a racist per se, but his ideas fueled racism. In 1924, there was a newspaper called the New York Tribune that used to be published, and it had a headline, the missing links were found in Australia, the Australian Aborigines. Did you know scientists from England and Germany sent people to Australia with instructions uh, on uh, how to skin the Aborigines, how to boil up their skulls for specimens for museums. They actually paid property owners to go on their properties, herd them over cliffs to kill them, herd them into swamps to, to kill them. And then they took their, their skin and their skulls back for museums all in the name of evolution. Five to 10,000 Aboriginal graves were desecrated in the name of evolution. A lot of people don't know about that. It's a sad part of Australia's history. You know what else is interesting? You see, you have people like President Obama, who on the one hand seems to be talking about, you know, we've got to stop racism and prejudice, and yet he actually fuels racism and prejudice by even talking about races when there's no different races and because he believes in evolution. See, an evolu evolution inherently is a racist philosophy. You can't get away from it. I know that's not politically correct to say that today, and they don't want to say it, but the textbooks used to. I'll show you in a moment. You know, when President Obama was over in Ethiopia in 2015, and he saw the bones of Lucy. He used to, it, the Lucy was supposedly one of our ape-like ancestors, and now they would say ape-like relative, and it depends where they put her on the, on the evolution tree, because that changes uh, over time. And this is what President Obama said. You know, Ethiopians are an ancient people in an ancient land. We honor Ethiopia as the birthplace of humankind. Ethiopia is the birthplace of humankind? Wait a minute, the whole world was wiped out by a flood. <laughs> God made Adam and Eve, not in Ethiopia, because it didn't even exist originally. In fact, I just met Lucy, our oldest ancestor. Oh, look, the bones of a chimp. Wow, my ancestor. This is the President of the United States. As your great, great poet laureate wrote, here is the land where the first harmony in the rainbow was born. Here is the root of the genesis of life. The human family was first planted here. We are reminded that Ethiopians, Americans, all people of the world are part of the same human family. Well, actually we are the same human family. <laughs> But he's not referring to just humans. We're all part of the apes. The same chain. And as one of the professors who was describing the artifacts correctly pointed out, so much of the hardship and conflict and sadness and violence that occurs around the world, he's, he's referring to the racism and prejudice and so on, is because we forget, we forget what? That we're all related to the apes. No wonder we got problems. We look at superficial differences, differences as opposed to the fundamental connection we all share. We're connected to the apes. And he should have also gone on and said, and we're connected to bananas. <laughs> I'll add that for him. <laughs> and we're connected to tapeworms. I'll add that for him too. Did you know the biology textbook that was mainly used in the public schools back in the early 1900s. In fact, at the time of the Scopes trial, this was a textbook that was used in public schools across America. Do you know what it taught the students based on Darwin's ideas? At the present time, there exist upon the earth five races, the highest type of all the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. You want to know, want to know why generations had racism fueled in their thinking? They went to public schools and were taught on the basis of evolution, the Caucasians are the highest race. That was taught in the public schools. They don't want to admit it today, politically incorrect today. Oh, but they still teach evolution, still teach Darwin's ideas. They just hide these sort of facts. 
See, people, I'm going to say something to us. I want to challenge us as God's people. I'm going to challenge us not to use the word races. Let's get rid of the word races. I'll tell you why. Because of the influence of Darwinian evolution that permeates our thinking, even the best of people tend to think of primitive races, advanced races, higher races, lower races. We all think that way. You know what I find? I find that most people, even in our churches, think in an evolutionary way and they don't know it. I'll give you an example. You know what a lot of people have said to me, even in conservative churches? Well, you're using modern tools to build the ark. Oh, yeah. This is the world we live in. They have the tools we have. Well, Noah didn't have those tools. Why don't you build it like Noah did? Oh, yeah, the Bible tells us exactly how he did it. Yeah, it tells us all the tools, lists of all. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, how did he do it? Well, he, well, he didn't have all those tools. He wouldn't use cranes. How do you know that? Well, I mean, I mean, how could he build a boat like that? You know what they're really doing? They've got an evolutionary view of history. They're thinking in terms of, how could someone back then do that? They don't have the sophistication we got. I got news for you. Noah was probably much more intelligent than us. We degenerated. We're like poodles. <laughs> we are. And you know what else? Noah lived for hundreds of years. Can you imagine Thomas Edison's living for hundreds of years before the flood? What technology they might have accumulated? People, we don't even know how those people in South America built some of those stone structures. We don't even know how they could have lifted the 400 ton blocks, some of them. We're not even sure how they built the pyramids. There's no way Noah could build an ark. See, the other problem is we're not used to wooden ships in our modern day. In, in 2, 300 BC, there's records of ships that were probably bigger than Noah's ark. People knew how to build them. He probably had better tools than we've got. He would probably look at us and say, man, you people, you people need to know how to do this. See, we've got this evolutionary view. It permeates our thinking. Let's get rid of the term races. At the time of Thomas Jefferson, when you talk about races, you meant the English race or the Irish race. You meant an ethnic group. But people today, there's those evolutionary connotations. So I challenge Christians, don't use the term races. Let's use terms like people groups. That's what I like, people groups. See, I believe the Al Sharptons of this world and the Jesse Jacksons are fueling racism. You know why they're fueling racism? Because they talk about the races. And they talk about the black people and the white people. I'm going to sh show you that there are no black people and there are no white people. And we know that there are no races when it comes to humans. Scientists know that. See, the Journal of Counseling Development, 1998. Evidence continues to collect that the term race is meaningless, used to point out differences in people that are not defended. See, most of us are taught there's a Caucasoid race, a Mongoloid race, a Negroid race, the Australoid race. I was taught that when I went to university. You know what I never thought to ask my professors? How did they determine the races? On what basis? When the Human Genome Project, which was actually headed by an atheist, Dr. Mentor, when they draft together an entire sequence of the human genome in the world, getting genes from people, groups all over the world, it goes on to say, and they unanimously declared there is only one race, the human race. This was headline news in the year 2000. Guess what we found? Genetically, there's only one race. Wow. That's a revelation. Let me ask you this question. Why did not the Christian world jump up and say, told you. Been telling you all along there's only one race. We all go back to Adam and Eve. You know why? Because I don't think most people know what they believe. Because most churches haven't taught the book of Genesis. It's too controversial. Many pastors, Christian leaders have compromised Genesis with evolution millions of years. Others have said it creates too much division in my church. I'm not touching it. And we have whole generations who don't understand their history. So we're not standing up, dealing with the issue of racism in the right way. There's only one race. And people, the church has been lax in this. Because the church should be leading the way, fighting racism and prejudice. If we understand God's word, we should be leading the way. And we haven't been because we've been influenced by the world and because we haven't had leaders that have taught what they should have taught from the book of Genesis. Now, I'm not saying all leaders, you understand that, but the majority, certainly. 
You know, as we go on here, in Nature Genetics, a secular evolutionist journal, in 2004, humans vary only slightly at the DNA level, and only a small proportion of this variation separates continental populations or people groups. And this is in the American Biology Teacher, 2011, another secular uh, uh, journal. Here is the biological problem with race. The genetic variation within each of the various ethnic groups of Homo sapiens is greater than that between the various ethnic groups. Do you realize what they're saying? The secular world is saying what we'll call distinct races, the variation, genetic variation within each group is greater than that between different groups. Which means what? The idea of races when it comes to humans is not there. It's meaningless. This is research that came out of France, was published in Nature Genetics Evolutionist Secular Journal, but the genes that explain the phenotypic differences, characteristics like hair color, I'll show you skin shade in a moment, between populations only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again that the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. People, the secular world, the scientists in the secular world doing what we call observational science that we agree with, are all saying there's only one race of humans, the concept of race has been abolished, and yet we get many of these political leaders and activists pushing the idea of races because they want to fuel racism, in my opinion, for political reasons. American biology teacher, 2011, all humans are one race, homo sapiens. There is absolutely no genetic or evolutionary justification for racial categories of humans. New York Times, the year 2000, responding to the human genome research, the criteria that people use for race are based entirely on external features we are programmed to recognize. And people in this culture, we're programmed to look, if we're really honest about it, we're programmed to look at skin color. Because there's the black people and the white people. We hear that all the time, don't we? See, there are no black people and there are no white people. Do we have different colors, or is it the same color in different shades? It's actually the same color in different shades. There's a number of pigments, but the main pigment is a pigment called melanin, which is a brown pigment, a couple of different forms of it, and it's a very complex how it all happens. But the big picture is this. If big A and big B mean a lot of melanin, and little A and little B mean a little bit of melanin, then if you have all big A's and big B's, a lot of melanin, dark skin, little A's and little B's, light skin, Mixture, you'd be in the middle, middle brown. The majority of the world's population are middle brown. So what shade was Adam and Eve's skin? Not color, what shade? Because we all have the same color. You see, we need to change our terminology. Not just races, but instead of talking about what color is someone's skin, it should be what shade. Instead of talking about races, I suggest people groups. We've got this idea that these are colored people and these aren't. Everyone in this room is a colored person. If you're not, you've got a problem. You want to be a colored person. You do. Doctors will tell you, yeah, you need to be a colored person. You need that pigment. Everyone's related to everyone else. So when you're praying for your lost relatives, there's millions and millions and millions of them. See, we need to redo a number of things. You know, let me give you a couple of examples here. I was at a church, and after I spoke on this, a man came up on the platform. He had very dark skin. People call him a black person. He wasn't black. He was a dark shade person. And he came up, and he looked at me, and he said, you mean we're all the one color? I said, yep. There's no black people, no white people? I said, nope. In fact, I can prove to you I'm not a white person. That's why, do I look like that? Because if I did, you'd be calling 911. What's your emergency? There is a white person talking to us. We got a problem. <laughs> so this man looked at me and he said, so we're all the same color? I said, yep. Huh. He said, I voted for President Obama because he was black and now you're telling me that was a stupid reason to vote for somebody. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. And then, you know, I use that as an example for the congregation. I said, do you realize we shouldn't vote for somebody because they're black or white or Republican or Democrat or independent? As Christians, we should be judging what people believe and say against the absolute authority of the word of God. 
and then judging accordingly and making decisions on that basis. And, and think about, oh, I remember there was another church I was at, there was a man sitting with a pastor actually, a man and his wife. He had very dark skin, she had very light skin. You know what people call that? An interracial marriage. Well, that can't be because there's no races. So there's no such thing as an interracial marriage when it comes to biology. And anyway, he was with the pastor and he turned to the pastor and he said, this is great. I'm really pleased to know I'm not married to a white woman. <laughs> and you know what else? You remember that chorus we all learned at Sunday school? You think about thousands and thousands, millions of kids that learned that chorus. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. All are precious in his sight. People, that taught them wrong ideas. I was at one conference and a young lady came up to me and she said, oh, Mr. Ham, I've... Um, I've written some different words to that song. And I said, oh, so have I. I said, let me hear yours first. And she said, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, shades of brown from dark to light, all are precious in his sight. And I said, that is great. Shades of brown from dark to light. That teaches them the truth. She said, what, was your, what were your words? Well, mine didn't have the finesse of this young lady. I said, I, I'm a teacher and I like to say things in a blunt sort of way sometimes. So Mine were, Jesus loves the children, all the children of the world, brown and brown and brown and brown and dark brown and light brown and medium brown and brown. <laughs> Do you realize Adam and Eve wouldn't have had light skin because if they had all little A's and little B's, the whole world would be like that. Adam and Eve wouldn't have had dark skin because if they had all big A's and big B's, the whole world would be like that, which, which does not fit with the genetic variability we see in the world. It makes much more sense that Adam and Eve were middle brown in the middle, like the dogs, the mixture of genes. And then their children could have been light through to dark in one generation. Do you know there are many middle brown people today that you'll see children who are darker than the parents, children lighter than the parents? Very easy to understand. In fact, National Geographic in 2002 had an article on the fact that there's only one race and everyone is the same skin color. This is a secular evolutionist journal teaching everyone we have the same skin color. They said, yet with the effects of human migrations and cultural habits, people in one place can show tremendous variation in skin tone, which means shade, like students from Washington International Primary School, and they lined them all up here to show you from a light tone through to a dark tone. And see, think about it. This person would be more like the, the, you know, the analogous too, the big A's and big B's, if she married someone like that, they'd have children like that. This one's more likely, the little A's and little B's, she married someone like that, have children like that. These are more middle brown, so they married someone who is middle brown, their children could be like this through to this. You get the idea? Now it's much more complicated than that, and there are sex-linked genes, and it depends on who marries who, and all sorts of other issues that are involved, but that's the big picture to help us understand. And that's why there are many examples in the world of twins. These are twins from Australia. These are twins uh, in England. These are twins in England, and uh, there was a report on them recently, and there they are, and they just had a second set of twins, and they're also dark and light. And then these twins here, and these here, and these here. It, it's very easy to understand. I remember one church, I was showing those twins, and I had one man ask me, now are they identical twins? <laughs> That's when you just say to yourself, you know, it's probably hopeless. I may as well just go home. So, because of the Tower of Babel, if you ended up with people that only had big A's and big B's, on their own, that's all they produce. If you end up with people that have only little A's and little B's, that's all they produce. Poodles with poodles only produce poodles. You get the idea? And it's the same with eye shape. It's just a minor variation on the, uh, a minor um, feature on the outside, maybe the amount of fat in your eyelid, but it's to do with genetic variability. It's just minor genetic variability. And that's why even ABC News back in 1998 said what the facts show is there are differences among us, but they stem from culture, not race. See, that's the thing we need to understand. And I'm going I'm to apply this as a Christian to sort of bring this uh, to a close tonight. I always say that so you think I'm getting near the end. But <laughs> notice what they say. The differences stem from culture, not race. Even the secular world says that. But for the Christian, that has a special meaning, as I want to show you. And see, do you know what the answer to racism is? The answer to racism is not a political solution. In fact, the answer in America to America's problems, not a political solution. 
You can't legislate morality and make that work. It's not a political solution we need, it's a spiritual solution we need. People's hearts and minds. That's why for us as a ministry, for us, we're not, we're, we're, we're not trying, now I know there are people out there doing things in the community and that's fine, and doing things in your area to be salt and light. But as a ministry, what we want to do is impact hearts and lives because we realize the more people we can see one to the Lord who build their thinking on God's word, they'll be salt and light to affect the culture because it's hearts and minds that change a culture. You know, the devil knows that and he captured hearts and minds of generations, our kids, and changed the culture. And we let him do it in many ways because we handed our kids over to them, to the world. And that's what I spoke on this morning. You know, think of the witness you can be. You know, next time you go to a doctor's surgery or dentist or something, they ask you to fill out those five million page forms and they ask you, what race are you? Can you imagine if you write down, Adams? <laughs> can you imagine the girl at the counter? Excuse me, what, what, what's this Adams race? Oh, let me tell you about that. Adam, he was the first man. Did you know we're all descendants of Adam? Did you know Adam sinned? That's why we died. Do you know that's why you're going to die? Do you know that's why Jesus stepped into history to be the God man to die on a cross and be raised from the dead? You need to repent of your sin right now. Think you could, you could present the gospel in 30 seconds. Well, the next time you fill out your census form, you know, what race are you? Human? That'll shock the person reading it. But you know, we can do that sort of thing. Are we game to? Why shouldn't we do that as a witness to people? See, the answer to racism is this. We need to see hearts and minds changed who build their thinking on God's word. There's only one race. We all go back to Adam and Eve. We're all equal before God. We all have the same problem, sin, and we all need the same solution, Jesus Christ. And every one of us needs to judge what we think and believe and say against the absolute authority of the word of God. That is the solution to racism. And I want to deal with one last issue. And I mentioned it before because I get asked over and over again, so what do you think about interracial marriage? Well, there's no such thing. According to God's word, there's only one biological race. But I'm going to shock you all. Because really I don't believe in one race. You see, in Louisiana, there are two. In California, there's two. In Kentucky, there's two. Have I got you confused? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness, which is not talking about light and dark skin. It's a biblical principle we should use, but it's talking about the fact that it's spiritual light and spiritual darkness. You're either for Christ or against. You either walk in light or you walk in darkness. You either gather or you scatter. Here's the point. Which impending marriage does God's word clearly counsel against? Does he clearly counsel against A? Does he clearly counsel against B? Or does he clearly counsel against C? Which one does God's word clearly counsel against? C. Biological fact, all humans belong to one race. Spiritual fact, all humans are divided into two races. What are the difference between the two spiritual races? The direction in which they are racing. I meet people, there are families in America who are more concerned their son or daughter not marry someone from a different biological race when there's no such thing, instead of whether they are of the same spiritual race, which is what that issue of marriage is all about. And people, if we're honest, we see racism in the churches because we see what are called black churches and white churches and you don't mix. You see that all across this nation. And there are churches that are predominantly light skinned that, that look down on people if they come in that have dark skin and the opposite, those that have dark skin mainly and, and they sort of you know, look down a bit on those that have, have so-called white skin. We, we see that in our churches. We have got to deal with those issues as a church. See, the interracial marriage that God's word speaks against is a marriage between the spiritual races. And I want to do this as an application as, as we finish off here. Let me give you an example. Take Rahab. We, we could also take Ruth. 
Moabite. But take Rahab in Jericho, presumably a descendant of Ham in a Canaanite city, a Canaanite. And yet it seems that same Rahab is in the lineage leading to Jesus. Wait a minute, the Israelites were told not to marry the Canaanites. Yeah, they were. Well, how could that be? Because she stopped being a Canaanite spiritually and became an Israelite spiritually. And when she believed in the true God, she's free to marry someone who believes in the true God. It wasn't a biological issue. It was a spiritual issue. And so I've got a challenge for us. You know what we need to do? We need to stop looking on the outside, thinking the differences we see are major differences that, that, that we've got to look at. They're minor. We're programmed to look at them, but they're minor genetic differences, just variation within the humankind. I'm going to suggest to us that what we need to do is start looking at people the way God does. You know, he gives us an example. You remember when Samuel came to anoint the king? He didn't know it was David. And from the context of 1 Samuel 16, you can imagine, put it in our modern vernacular, wow, look at this young man. He's tall, handsome, the football star at his school, all the girls run after him. Wow, he, he's obviously going to be the king. Remember what God said? The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know what's interesting? Evolutionists try to convince children of evolution by getting them to look at the outside. When we looked at the inside, we realized it's not evolution. And unfortunately, we look at the outside instead of the inside. Practical application. Somebody comes into your church, has a different shade of skin to you. We need to stop looking at that as a major issue. And we need to look at, there's one of my relatives. Do they need the Lord? Do they need my help in some way, my love in some way? What can I do for them? Welcome, you're one of our family. We need to deprogram ourselves. You know, I had one man come up to me and he said, after you gave that talk, I just got on the telephone and I called my family and I repented of sin and apologized because we had what we thought was an interracial marriage in our family and we've treated them terribly. I just called up to repent and apologize. And I've apologized to the Lord. You see, just because our parents taught us something or, or a pastor or someone else, people, we need to stand back and say, but what does God's word say? Am I prepared to change and to make sure it's what God's word says. I challenge every one of us concerning that. Another practical application. Imagine you, I, there's a street in Cincinnati. You could drive down and see drug deals on the street. Might not be the right time to stop and go witness to them. You may not have a car when you come back. Some of those streets you won't have wheels by the time you get down the end of the street. But you know, does it ever burden your heart to look at people like that and say, they're probably going to a Christless eternity and they're my relatives, they're my family. How can I reach them? Is there an inner city mission that I could support? Is there something our church is doing to reach these people? What, what, there, are, there are special ministries that, that reach these inner city people. Maybe I could help them in some way. We often have them call us and say, we've got all these inner city kids that we minister to, we want to bring them to the Creation Museum. You know, we say, you bring them. We're not going to charge you for them. The rest of the people from, from Louisiana who, who, who can pay, like all the people in this room, <laughs> they're the ones that are going to pay for them, but you, you bring them free. What about a Christian young lady? She looks at a guy at school. Oh, he's the football star. Wow, he's strong and handsome. Wow, I wish he'd asked me to go out. You know what, young lady? Does he love the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and all his mind? Because that's what matters. It's not the outside that matters. It's the inside. Or a Christian guy. And he says, oh, look at that girl. She's so pretty, so attractive. Just the right of melanin I like. <laughs> wow, I'd like to go out with her. 
You know what, young man? Does she love the Lord with all her heart and all her soul and all her mind? It is not the outside that matters, it is the inside. And I've got a message for all the guys, which is very important. The outside changes with time. <laughs> Look at the mother and you'll get exactly what I mean. Now I've insulted everyone in the room. <laughs> you know, last weekend my wife was with me in Kerry, North Carolina when I spoke, but she couldn't come uh, this weekend. She, she loves to be with our grandchildren. We are 14 plus one on the way and she's always involved with them. And, uh, but when she's with me and I'm talking on this topic, I say, take my wife. I remember when she was 17, gorgeous, beautiful, and now, 45, six years later, there she is, more gorgeous than ever. <laughs> See, I know the right thing to say. <laughs> but you know what we've got to understand? If you fall in love with the outside, you can fall out of love. But if you choose to love the inside and make that commitment before the Lord, that's what it's all about. We've been married for this year, 40-something, I don't know, she knows, but uh, I think it's 44 this year, 44 year, 43, 44, it's, 40, it's around 44 plus or minus one or two, but it's around 44 years. And people often look at us today and say, you've been married for 44 years? Wow, what? Why is that so? Well, in today's world it is. But we love each other more than we've ever loved each other. You see, young people, I want to tell you, that's what it's all about. Do you realize tonight, think about what we did. We talked about Cain's wife, natural selection, speciation, poodles, <laughs> mentioned cats, <laughs> Noah's Ark, how he could fit the animals on the Ark, skin color, Tower of Babel, genetics, dating and marriage. Now, that's a mixture for you. But you know why? Because you see, all of our doctrines are based in that history. And when you take that history, you know why children love the Creation Museum? And young people love this ministry? It makes the Bible real. And you see, here's the problem in a lot of our churches, a lot of our kids, well, there's issue of racism here and, 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 and evolution and marriage and gay marriage and abortion and, and, and there's Jesus on the cross and, and the virgin birth and Paul's missionary journey and the stuff is all over the place and they, they don't know what to do. Do you realize when you take that history in Genesis and you then lay that as the foundation, which is what we do at the Creation Museum, we have a Bible curriculum, a three-year Bible curriculum that does that. Thousands of churches are using it. They say it's revolutionizing their churches, their young people and their adults because what we're doing is we're walking you through that history and we show because of this, that happened. And then this and that happened and this. And, and because of that, that doctrine's built on this and this doctrine's built on that. And here's how to answer the skeptical questions that stop people believing that. And it brings it all together. And the reason that so many of our kids don't know what to believe, don't know why they believe what they do, and, and, and they're all over the place, is because we've ignored that history in Genesis 1 to 11 that is the key history that's foundational to all of our doctrine, our whole worldview. And when we do what we did tonight, we can deal with racism, we can deal with prejudice. We can even apply it to dating and marriage. What a difference it makes. And you know, that's one of the reasons why we provide all those resources for you. And we have different combinations at, at, at different prices. We want you to get them, one race, one blood. Uh, what I did tonight in much more detail. The Tower of Babel, our son-in-law, Bodhi, who works at the ministry, he compiled this book. Did you know there are names in cultures all over the world today that are traced back to Ham, Sham, and Japheth? It's powerful. The Four Answers books, 120 of the top asked questions with detailed answers, including where the races come from, where did Cain get his wife, all of those. The most asked questions people ask, they are the leading creation apologetics books in the world. And then we have kids ones. You know, we had young kids, sort of around 10, 9, 8 years old. We said, send us your questions you have about the Bible. Guess what the questions were? What about dinosaurs? Where did Cain get his wife? How to explain all the people if we all go back to Adam and Eve? They had, they had the same questions the older people have, so we, we did this series specially for young kids. 
You can use it as devotions, Dad. A, a, a whole series of a whole series we have here. You know, I said series. Do you know what happened? <laughs> Stupid phone. <laughs> she answered me. I can't say that word, obviously. Again, go away. If you don't have an iPhone, you will not understand that. I didn't realize she'd been watching me this whole time. Do you know in our rhyme books for kids, you notice Adam and Eve and Middle Brown? Do you notice a lot of children's books that your children use, Christian books, have Adam and Eve as Caucasian white, so to speak? When you come to the Creation Museum, you'll notice that our, our figures of Adam and Eve are middle brown. See, there's a lot more to it than, than people realize. We have a big book of history for kids, folds out 15 feet from Adam and Eve all the way through the present, showing how all the cultures fit together. And then we have one for uh, that's more detailed, 25 feet, folds out, shows you how it all fits together, back to Adam and Eve, the flood, the Tower of Babel, and all these cultures that are developed. And by the way, through all that complicated history, God prever preserves the message of the promised seed back in the garden. God st steps into history to die on a cross, be raised from the dead. 30 apologetics lessons for ages 7 through 12 with color handouts that you can hand out to them, get extras on the web. We need to be teaching our kids apologetics. Dads, you could do this. You know what? With our kids, even for the older kids, when we would read the, 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 other, uh, the kids, kids' books, the older kids would sit there with us too. And you can buy some of those books even for little kids. Even when our, our kids were born, even little babies, you know what we would do? We'd show them the pictures. And eventually we'd tell what, what they meant. And eventually we would read it. And then eventually they would read it. You can train your children these, in, in, in these things. My book, The Lie, is really the message I've been bringing this weekend. Why the book of Genesis matters. I challenge every Christian to read that. And then Ready to Return, Already Gone, those two books that deal with the research as to what's happened to our coming generations. Books on the six days and the age of the earth, why Christians need to take a stand on God's word. And those six days were ordinary days. We have a book on uh, the Bill Nye debate. If you never saw it, we actually have a, a box set out there with that book, which has a transcript of the debate and everything Bill Nye brought up answered. And then we have um, another book called Confound the Critics, uh, how to how to deal with uh, sec secularists and how, how to debate people. And then with the video of the debate, we put it all together and we have a debate the critics set. I'm talking on dinosaurs in the morning to the young kids. So uh, you're all welcome to come along and uh, hear about that. And if you want a creation apologetics conference like I, I've done this weekend, even a bit more detail, the talk I did tonight, uh, something similar to what I'm doing tomorrow night, although I never do them exactly the same way, but uh, something similar to what I did this morning, uh, but there's a lot more in it. There's 12 30-minute videos there of m major talks that I do and a curriculum that goes with it, and we highly discount it down to uh, $69. And then the Begin book, my favorite witnessing book. We present the gospel starting at the beginning, Genesis 1 to 11, then Exodus 20, the law, then the book of John, the life of Christ, the book of Romans, uh, the Gospel in Detail, last two chapters of Revelation, New Heavens, New Earth, and a summary of the Bible. It's just a great book to read through as sort of a summary of the Bible. And then, 10 of the most asked questions with short answers to show we can defend our faith. And then what does it mean to be saved? And then we let you have that for a, a highly discounted price. We want people, use it as a devotion book. Give it away to people. Present the Gospel starting at the beginning. And our Answers magazine is the leading Christian creationist worldview magazine. It teaches you, keeps you t taught uh, how to develop a Christian worldview has a mini magazine for kids in the middle and if you subscribe we give you a free DVD for each year you subscribe and one last thing I wanted to mention was our Answers Bible curriculum it's a three year curriculum thousands of churches are using it in their Sunday schools thousands of homeschoolers are using it for their Bible curriculum it's three years it's chronological from Genesis to Revelation it's for preschool kindergarten all the way through <clears throat> through adult so we have different age levels in it Answers Bible Curriculum stands for A for Apologetics, B Biblical Authority, C Chronological. And as we go through, we connect Old and New Testament. It teaches doctrine and it teaches you how to defend your faith and answer the critics of the age all the way through. And people we have churches say it revolutionizes them. You know, I'll tell you the two complaints we get from this. And the two complaints are these. One, 
The older generation don't like it because they have to learn too much. We've actually had that said to us. But then we get the churches that say they love it because they've never learnt so much. And then the other one is, we can't get our Sunday school teachers to use it because they can't just get up Sunday morning and go in and teach it. They have to prepare during the week. Which is a good thing because that sorts out those who should be Sunday school teachers or not. And we let you have one of the quarters there. You'll see it might be more than one, but at a special price. Our answers in Genesis website, thousands and thousands of articles. Use it as a resource. We have a number of different websites. We, we have 25 million unique users a year on our website. It's one of the most accessed Christian websites in the world. Use it as a resource. We have a kids website. We have the ARC website. We have the Creation Museum website. We have a technical journal, Answers Research Journal. It's free. All these technical research articles. We have a lot of different material there. People, we can't go to the world. You can. And that's what I'm going to do tomorrow night. I'm going to explain to you tomorrow night what, how should we be reaching the world. I believe many churches, most churches, most Christians are not reaching people with the gospel the way we need to in a secularized culture. And I'm going to talk on that tomorrow night as the final uh, presentation. And then tomorrow morning, uh, we'll deal with dinosaurs, K to six. And then uh, it's going to be like being in a science class for the, for the high schoolers at 11 o'clock from 11 to 12.30. So how about we stand and we pray and then you're dismissed. And the materials are out there in the lobby. A gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. Oh, Lord, we're burdened when we look at our culture and we see what's happening. And Lord, we're burdened for the church too. Lord, we pray that you would burden Christian leaders, parents, young people, to get back to the authority of your word right from the very beginning. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have compromised, even, even unwittingly, Lord, that we've Listen to the words of fallible humans and we've compromised your word. Lord, we pray that you would embolden each one of us. Help us to be equipped so that, Lord, we, we're not going to be worried about going out and talking to people and challenging them. Help us to, to study, to have answers so that we can defend the Christian faith and we can stand and, and proclaim your word with authority and boldness and to be unashamed. Lord, we pray that you would watch over each one of us now as we leave. Bless the programs in the morning for the young people and the children. Pray lots would come and, and that they would really be excited for you and set on fire for you. Lord, keep us safe now as we travel to our various places where, where we stay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.